Here's one last story that I just can't pass up dealing with the important subject of revival in our nation. I believe that America is ripe for revival today. I feel that we need revival in our land. Today's public schools need to repent and teach education from God's perspective. Godless teachers need to fall on their knees and repent and once again teach the Bible in the classroom as they did in the past. Our government needs to repent from greed and corruption. Abortion needs to stop. Pornography outlawed. There is so much that time in this short devotion would not allow me to cover all the areas that I believe revival would naturally take care of. Either we'll have revival in America or the judgment of God awaits us. The Bible says, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that shall he reap. We cannot fool God. He sees and knows exactly what we're up to as a people and as a nation. God's grace is towards us and he desires us to experience revival. Take for example how God worked in the lives of the following four people in this fantastic frontier story on revival. Methodist revival preachers on the frontier enjoyed camp meetings. They encouraged the flocks who came to listen to shout and sing. Camp meetings, it was customary to have the sinners penned down. They called them penitent pens. They were in front of the assembly, and they were areas where the sinners would come down for prayer. Sometimes a man or woman would fall prostrate in this area called the pen, and they would rise up with shouts of glory, saying, Glory to God, or Hallelujah, or Praise the Lord. The minister would then add his voice to the shouts of praise, and he'd shout out himself, Another sinner's down. Glory to God. Well, smart Alex and Rowdy sometimes mimicked these old-time preachers, much to their religious indignation. In his autobiography, Peter Cartwright tells of an experience of this kind which befell him in Springfield, Illinois. One day, he had ridden in to do some trading, and he noticed a party of three young people whose clothes made them stand out like a sore thumb in this old Wild West frontier town. After finishing his trading, Peter Cartwright mounted his horse and started for home. About two miles from town, he overtook a light wagon drawn by two excellent horses. The wagon's cover was rolled back, and he saw the passengers were the very two dudes and the fashionable young lady that he'd seen in the store while shopping earlier. Peter wrote in his autobiography the following. As I drew near them, they began to sing one of the camp meeting songs that I was familiar with. They appeared to be singing with great joy. The young lady began to shout and say, Glory to God! Glory to God! The driver cried out, Amen! Glory to God! My first impression was that they'd been across the Sagamon River to a camp meeting that I knew was going on there. I drew near to the lady and the men and began to hear them shout again. Glory to God. Then one young man who was not driving fell backward into the wagon and cried out for mercy. The other two shouted, the girl and the driver, at the top of their voice, Glory to God! Glory to God! Another sinner's down! They began to exhort one another and exhort the man that was down, saying, Pray on, brother! Pray on, brother! You'll soon get religion, you see. Just pray on! Soon after, he jumped up, and then they switched drivers. He said, God's bless my soul, hallelujah, hallelujah, but God's bless my soul. Thinking all was right, I decided to ride up and join in the songs of triumph and the shouts of joy that rose from these three happy persons. But as I neared the wagon, I saw the glances in their eyes as they looked at each other and at me, it gave me suspicion that not everything was right. The thought occurred to me that they knew that I was a preacher and they were carrying on this way to mock the sacred things of God and to fool me. I pulled up the reins on my horse and I fell back to ride slowly, hoping that they'd pass on and leave me. But they pulled up the reins on their horses and went slow. They did this so that they could irritate me some more. Well, as the driver switched, he sat back. Presently, he began to say, Glory to God! Glory to God! 
I feel the Lord's coming on me. Oh, pray for me, brother and sister. I'm going down. And back he went into the wagon. This went on, back and forth. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. And then they said, pray on, brother. You'll soon get religion. Pray on. Hallelujah. A rush of fury came all over me. I thought I'd ride up and horsewhip those two varmints. But the woman was in the presence of them. And I thought it wouldn't be right. So I held back. And I was so grieved that if my horse had been faster as it was in the early days, I would have rode right past them and left him. But stiff as he was, I fell back and listened to this. I tell you, it was more than any good preacher ought to bear. Now, preacher Peter Cartwright, wondering how long he'd have to put up with his crude heckling, recall that about a mile ahead was a deep, treacherous mud hole. Many wagons got stuck there and had to be pried out. On the right-hand side of the road, at this point, stood a stump about two feet high. Avoiding to get stuck, it was necessary for the driver who knew of this mud hole and stump to ride as close as possible to the stump, avoiding the mud hole. There was a bridle path that skirted this disagreeable spot, and Cartwright determined to ride his horse at top speed along it to pass his tormentors. This would be a perfect time because he knew the mud hole would slow him down. Now Peter goes on to say in his autobiography, When we came to the beginning of the mud, I took the bridle path and put spurs and whipped my horse. Seeing I was rapidly leaving the rear of the wagon, the driver cracked his whip and got his horses going full speed to keep up with me. Going so fast, they never saw the stuff on the right. The front of the wheel hit dead center on the stump, lifting up the wagon and nearly turning it over. Fearing that it would entirely turn over and catch them under it, pinning them down, the two young men leaped into the mud pit and landed right up to the waist. The young lady who was dressed in a beautiful white dress, as the wagon nearly went over, she jumped as far as she could and landed on all fours. Her hands were stuck in the mud up to her armpits, and her mouth and whole face was immersed in the muddy water, and she would have drowned had the two young men not come to her rescue. <laughs> I wheeled my horse around to see this fun. I rode up to the edge of the mud pit, stopped my horse, reared up my reins, and shouted to the top of my voice, Glory to God! Glory to God, hallelujah, another sinner's down, glory to God, hallelujah. Peter Cartwright went on and delivered a stiff lecture on the consequences of mocking God, since they had just experienced some of those consequences. The mud-faced sinners were now in a mood to listen. By the way, it turned out that the three were from Ohio. They'd come there for a visit. But before returning home, they attended one of Peter Cartwright's camp meetings. And do you know what? They ended up in the penitence pen and really did obtain religion. Peter Cartwright went on to baptize them and welcome them into the Methodist church. And at their water baptismal, the cry truly went out, Glory to God! I like that. I like to give you an observation from the scripture. You realize that God loves sinners. He never gives up on us, even those that mock God. Those who mock God today can be saved. It's never too late. Our Lord Jesus is doing everything he can to change sinners into saints. I wonder, did he take you from a mud pit of sin into salvation? Jesus did take me. Really, the only difference between sinners is the size of the mud pit. So whether God has delivered you from a small pit of sin or a big one, they both have something in common. They're mud pits, large or small. He alone can wash us clean through the blood of Jesus. All I can say is the same thing that Peter Cartwright said. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Another sinner's down.